Welcome to The Future of What. I'm Portia Sabin. Recently, The Future of What traveled to San Francisco so I could moderate a panel at SF Music Tech Summit 17. This conference brings together people from the music and tech world so we can get a chance to network and collaborate on new apps, new ideas, and new technology in the music marketplace. My panel was called The Future of Indies, and the lineup was amazing. The room was packed and everyone had a good time, so we hope you enjoy it too. Uh, (laughs) Nice start. Way to go. Okay, so we have a truly fabulous star-studded panel here today, and I'm going to go down the line and let everybody introduce themselves really quickly. Hi, I'm Molly Newman. I'm the interim president and vice president of A2IM, which is the American Association of Independent Music, or a trade association for independent labels. We have about 360 record label members. We have about 160 or so associate member companies, which are people who want to intersect and engage with the independent community. I'm a former resident of the Bay Area, so I'm happy to be here. My name is Bruce Pavitt. I'm the founder of Seattle's Sub Pop Records, and I'm currently the creative director at 8STEM, a company which is going to be introducing an interactive digital format for musicians. I'm Christiane Kinney. I am wearing two hats today. I am a CD Baby artist, and I am also an entertainment attorney at LeClaire Ryan, who's a sponsor today. I'm Kevin Bruner. I'm the VP of Marketing at CD Baby. We're a music distribution company, and for us, it's just important to help artists collect all the money they possibly can from their music, so we've started doing things like publishing administration, YouTube monetization, and, and so forth. Hi, I'm Amy Dietz. I'm the general manager of Engroove's Music Group, which is also a distributor. I write services management. We do label services, full-service distribution, physical and digital, based here in the Bay Area. We have offices in L.A. and New York and Germany and the U.K. So I think something that we lose sometimes in conversations about the music business, especially at tech conferences, is the perspective of why we all got into music in the first place and what we're really doing here. So I wanted everybody to speak briefly about how you guys got into the music business, what drew you, you know, if you're a musician yourself, tell us your story. Do you want me to start? Yeah. I got my first instinct or engagement with music was as an artist. Prior to that, I, uh, I wanted to have a radio show when I was a student at the University of Oregon. But my best friend in the dorms and the next door neighbor who's from Olympia sort of turned me on to a world of fans who were sort of challenging the complete construct of rock and roll. And that inspired us so much that we decided that we could start a band even though we didn't play any instruments. And... What we would do is go to frat parties and take over the mic during the jam band or whatever's set and sing Beat Happening songs. And um, it was really uh, rude to a lot of people, but we enjoyed it so much that we decided to make that a real band. So that's how I got started. And we had a fanzine and we were very influenced by feminist theory and women's studies and sort of connecting with other women who are making music and identifying areas of a lack where women weren't necessarily producing or running record labels or running distribution companies. And that became part of my lifelong mission, which is about continuing to improve myself and hopefully leave a little bit of a trail of sort of an idea that other people can do that. What was your band called, Molly? Oh, Bratmobile was my first band. (laughs) Thanks. Thank you, co-rock stars. I bought my first record player when I was nine years old, and I started spending all my money on on records. During my 20s, I had no car because, but I had a very large record collection. So I've always had a really deep fan obsessive relationship with music. When I was 21, I moved to Olympia and got a radio show at Chaos FM. It's the only station in the world that prioritized independent music. And I started a radio show called Subterranean Pop, where I started playing indie music, and the next year I started my own analog blog, also known as a Xeroxed fanzine. (laughs) And what I did is I started reviewing a lot of records that nobody else was reviewing, and I I, I realized that in every city in the country, bands were putting out records. And if you're from Milwaukee or Austin, Texas, etc., very few people were hearing about your music. So what I did is I organized all the records regionally so you could flip through the zine and see, oh, this is what's going on in the Midwest, this is what's going on in the Northwest. And I started to become very 
obsessed with scenes even even more than bands, you know. That zine transitioned into cassette compilations and then a record label that I started releasing records by Seattle bands out of my bedroom in Seattle and worked with Nirvana and Soundgarden and all sorts of bands and that, that all blew up. But my whole passion for community was part of the story and uh, I continued to be obsessed with, with regional cultures and communities and that's kind of what got me into music biz. Well... I think all the redheads on this panel will appreciate this one. I got into um, music when I was three, and Annie came out, and uh, and I, I went to uh, I went to see it on stage, and I immediately came home. We had an old organ, and I just started picking out the tunes and singing along, and my parents probably thought I was possessed, and they're like, we should get her in piano lessons. And so they, I actually wanted to learn the organ. There was a church organist at our church that was amazing. And my feet were too short to reach the pedals, so they put me on piano, and then I fell in love with that. Later fell in love with Tori Amos, another redhead, and that was the progression of my music love. And then when I went to law school, I studied for the bar. As soon as I took the bar, I recorded my first album, put it up on CD Baby pretty much right when CD Baby started, 98, 99, and became a CD Baby artist and an attorney. And so as an attorney, you know, my practice has gone on for 16, 17 years, but I decided I really wanted to give back to the independent community, so I started writing for DIY Musician and looking at ways that I could gift some of my legal knowledge to the indie community and help them understand better how to protect themselves and their works. I'm, I'm a guitar player, and, and when I was going off to college, I thought, well, I'll get in the music business. That'll be fun and exciting. <laughs> And uh, so I went to Nashville and ended up in a band called Small Town Poets, and uh, we were signed to a major label for a while and uh, had some success, but, uh, you know, as things go, kind of left frustrated and figured there had to be a better way and started releasing records independently, and that's when I came across CD Baby and realized they were in my own hometown, and so got a job there and have been there for 10 years. But for me, what keeps me excited about the music business, especially as an artist, is you never know when something is going to happen with your music, but there's going to be this spark that really drives some success or just fan engagement, and it's just that, that special, magical something that you just can't fabricate that just happens. And uh, to me, that's, that's what keeps me going as a musician and creating and writing and recording, still, still very active releasing music myself. So that's what keeps me going. And the big bucks, too. <laughs> <laughs> There's a, you'll probably notice a theme as we all talk about this. I grew up in Minneapolis, which has a very rich music history. Twin Tone Records, Amphetamine Reptile, Replacements, Husker Du, Prince, of course, you can't forget. So there was a, a pretty big culture of doing it yourself, watching fanzines like Sub Pop and uh, some of the other Maximum Rock and Roll, all of those kinds of things inspired me and a lot of my friends. So I had friends that created fanzines, friends that were in bands, I got signed to labels, and realized that there was actually kind of a, a business about part of this. I was a musician as well. I wasn't particularly good, so I decided that my I could be better use of helping uh, some of my other artist friends and making sure that they had a place that they could work with people that actually really cared about music. Community is a big part of, I think, what we all do. I think we really love being a part of something that's a little bit bigger than ourselves, and that's what really keeps me going. I've worked for record stores, I've worked for record labels, I've mostly spent my life in distribution. I worked for ADA for a long time, and I've been at InGroups for a long time. Worked with a lot of amazing labels, and it's what excites me every day, is seeing what is coming next and working with people that are really interested in what is best for the artist. So, love what I do. Awesome. And the big bucks, of course. And the big bucks. <laughs> <laughs> My story is the same as theirs. I, started, I bought my first album at 10 years old, and you know, I've just been a crazy music, crazy nutball ever since. Started my first band. Well, I tried to start a band when I was 14, but I couldn't find anyone to play with me because none of the other girls wanted to play instruments, and all the boys had already been playing in their bedrooms for three years, and they were really good, and I was really bad. So, <laughs> long story. But you know, I, 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 everything we've heard just now, I kind of want to ask you guys. What is exciting to you about this time that we're facing right now and what is challenging? Because I feel like 
almost every day we hear about new issues, especially with the digital marketplace. There's so the change is happening so rapidly. Are there things that you can pinpoint and just say, okay, this is a real challenge for us right now that we really have to face? And are there things that you can say, okay, I think we're going to be okay in this way? Like, for example, Spotify. Really good or really bad? Discuss. <laughs> I mean, I don't know that there's a, a one answer to that. I, I think that probably the, one of the biggest challenges is just the transition of how money comes in for an artist and for a label. When you go from selling a thing that has a higher value than a much longer tail of how your revenue comes in, it's really a challenge to figure out how you continue marketing, those kinds of things, getting a sense of how a record is really doing. But it's really about a transition, and I think that we discussed this a little bit before we came up here. There's there's people that are making that transition quicker, and it's hard to say that it's all bad or all good. I think it is having people that can help you through that transition, and I think it takes a lot for each individual to figure out what the best thing to do or how you take each step, part of it, make that part of your, your overall plan. So would you say, this is a question I've heard a lot, that record labels are still necessary? Mm-hmm. You just set me up for what so. I said before. In this day and age? <laughs> uh, I personally absolutely think that they're necessary. You know, we are, there's, there's lots of people that do different things here, but there's, we provide kind of label services to some artists directly, but breaking a band, nurturing a band, doing all of the pieces that it really takes to kind of off cycle, not just about a record or a single. I think that labels are a really important piece of that. And I think the label has a different purpose now than it used to, where, you know, back back when we were, our band Small Town Poets was getting a record deal, I mean, that was just so we could have access to the market. I mean, that's not a problem anymore. And I think artists need to approach it as, these are partners that can expand my reach, expand my fan base, and what am I going to do with that increased awareness of my music? Am I going to capitalize on it, or am I going to just squander it? But, you know, to me, I'm very optimistic because artists can own the relationship with their fans like never before, and if you're good, you know, communicating with your fans and giving them what they want, then there's tons of opportunity. If, if you're not good with communicating with your fans and you're kind of wanting someone else to manage that relationship for you, it might be a bit of a struggle. I think it depends on what you want, too, as an independent artist. I think there's opportunities, certainly, for you to build a great career with or without a label, but you have to be more and more creative and more able to think outside the box as far as how you're going to grab attention because it's needle in a haystack world, you know, I mean, there's so much out there. How are you going to stand apart? But the exciting thing right now about this time is all of these tech companies coming together and bridging that gap between consumers and between the artists. And there are opportunities more more than ever now for artists to really take hold and take these opportunities, discover these companies, work with them, and find a, a deeper relationship with their fans. And that's something that doesn't go away. If you really build that relationship with your fans, they stay with you. And you can build a career, you know, and you hear people say it all the time, you can, you can make $100,000 as an independent artist by doing basic things, but you got to kick yourself in the ass and really do stuff, you know? I mean, you're, you're not going to be able to sit back and you know, you are the label for yourself then. You are doing everything, and it's hard. That's exactly what I was, you know, thinking of, and I'm sure even on the sort of operational level at at CD Baby, each artist is their own label, correct? I mean, that's, I worked in the digital services side for many years, and that's, you know, there's always been that framework. So even if you are, you know, just Chris and your label, that's you as well. And I think what's necessary now is really to give everyone the access to information, the access to understanding what's happening because the challenge is, yeah, you're, you, even if you're a tiny artist, you're probably generating thousands of transactions at some marketplace, and what do you do with that? It's, you know, and so I don't expect that everyone has the skills and, you know, interpretation, and even established record companies may still be challenged by that. So I think that's where our organization is aiming to come into play and to help facilitate that understanding and to make sure that your artist-run labels are understanding exactly what's happening and, and optimizing all their opportunities. I think artists that are skilled in uh, creatively drawing attention to themselves can potentially do well without a label. On the other hand, I think 
labels are really valuable for curation. We, we could ask ourselves, does society need art galleries? Well, I, I think they do. I think we do. It's all about the curation. I love going to 4AD and checking out what they've got because I kind of like their vibe. And, and the curation helps me to navigate the millions and millions and millions of songs out there. So, Molly, let's go back to you for a second, because I want to talk about this, you know, this idea of community that we've brought up, but also the name of like what we are is independent labels. And to some extent, that has been really true in history. Like, I'm over here and you're over there and I'm not. No, we're not doing the same thing. Right. We are not merged. You we're not understand? joiners. <laughs> yes, we're, we're poor joiners. We play poorly <laughs> together. And yet we have this 10-year-old organization, A2IM, which is basically the indie label trade association that has 350 label members. So how's that going? <laughs> it's great. I mean, I think not without its own challenges, like every organization and company, but you know, we've grown since the organization started 10 years ago. The market share of independence has grown to over 35%. So that's up 10%. And not, you know, I don't think that there's one factor that influences that, but you know, our companies have gained strength and gained success, and that is, will continue to be the case. And you know, one of the biggest artists in the electronic world right now, Dead Mouse just left Universal very publicly. Many of you might have seen it in the news and it was, you know, sort of shedding and there might be some lawsuits, who knows, but they are now starting, you know, they've st had their own label, but now it's something that they're, you know, taking really seriously. And I think over the next, you know, couple of years, the goal will be to continue to establish the strength of our world and see how we can continue to chip away at market share, not because we're playing a numbers game and we're completely focused on that, but because that's the currently the only measurement that really is interpreted. One of the things we were talking about is our industry is very kind of loose in success metrics, I guess. We don't know what actual, you know, revenues are at, at any level, and there's a lot of uh, opaqueness there. So, you know, we'll see if that changes too. But um, I think it's going well, to answer your question, but there's still a lot more to do, of course. And this is for Kevin. I, when we were talking before, you were telling me that when you started at CD Baby, CD Baby was ingesting like maybe 40,000 new artists a year. Yeah. And that last year it was 120,000 120,000 releases, I'll say. Releases. Releases. Yes. Yeah, yes. releases. So clearly this music thing is not like going away. <laughs> like people are still <laughs> interested and still trying to get into the business. So what would you guys say, what are, what's your advice to, you know, because everyone always wants to know, what's your advice to young artists trying to get into the business. I mean, I, I would say that is, you know, if you're trying to get in the business, one, you need to be good at your art. So it's, I think one of the, the downfalls of modern technology is artists will be on the road to something and then they'll spend all their time on Twitter, Facebook, and all the, all the things that you need to use to connect with fans, but sort of stop developing themselves as an artist. It's still a long journey and I think you need to plan for the long journey. If you wanna build a catalog, that's going to gain value and build fans over time. So, I mean, I, I think it starts of understanding that, you know, it's probably not going to be success overnight. Most of the artists I talk to that have been using CD Baby for a long time, a lot of the things that they have in common is one, they have a large catalog. They've really spent time developing their craft over years. And, you know, the, the kind of other pieces, usually there's a YouTube component too. It's because it's just a medium that's really a great platform to communicating with fans, but you gotta be in it for the long haul and continue to develop yourself as an artist because your art has to be good. I mean, if you want people to connect and latch on to what you're doing and be a, support what you do, it's gotta be good. Anyone else? Yeah, let's get more advice. <laughs> more advice, please. Chris? I, I mean, I think that's exactly right, and Bruce was talking about curating when you're at the level where you're, you're choosing to do this yourself on CD Baby or the other one, or, um, <laughs> you know, I, there's, there's several, you know, independent platforms that you can choose. You are your own curator, and that can be dangerous as an artist because you don't always hear things the way your fans are going to hear them. So I would say vet your music, you know, try it out on stage maybe before you just post everything online. Sometimes people post really bad quality videos. I'm guilty of this too. You know, I, everybody does it. They just want to push content out. But I think 
to be successful, you have to focus on the quality and really vet your stuff to people and see what the reaction is. If you've got, you know, 10 songs in a set list and the fans are really responding to one, do the single for that one, you know, but make it really good. Focus on quality and people will pay attention. Any other advice? Anyway, anybody? I mean, I think there's tools that you can use depending on any one of these platforms of trying to really identify who your fan is and, and who is responding to what you're putting out in the marketplace, whether it's do most of your fans follow you on YouTube or is they, are they responding to Twitter? Or are they, how are they responding to you and identifying where you can engage with them and making sure that you're actually taking care of your fans, whether that's five people or 5,000 or 50,000, being aware of those things. And I think there's just a lot more data than there has ever been. That's, we can talk about that till we're blue in the face. But there's a lot of areas that you can actually gather that intelligence, whether it's on your own, by watching your own accounts, or using the tools that are supplied from, you know, we give a lot of analytics back to our labels and to the artists that we work with. Using that to the best of your ability to make sure you're making some decisions about how to continue to build that fan base. I would also add that you, you got to learn how to tell your story about who you are. You know, uh, we've mentioned that last year there was 120,000 new releases through CD Baby. That's a lot. And just... And we're not the only game in town either. So there's a lot of new music being released. And I know the biggest frustration artists have is like, how do I break through? And it starts with just learning how to communicate why you're unique, what's important about your music. Uh, I was at a conference last week and was talking to a gentleman that was telling me his, you know, his daughter had a new album out. And at first, you know, I kind of like, OK, whatever. But then he started telling me the story that she's a foster child. When they got her, she had uh, speech issues and and it wasn't until she was like six that she learned to talk and now she's this amazing singer that she just spent so much time and and now is really active in trying to help other individuals that were kind of in her situation to develop themselves and not be afraid to to sing and and it was just this very compelling story where like now I want to hear her music and instead when the conversation started this was just another person that that uh, had an album out. But then now I'm very interested in who this person is and what they're about. And I think artists spend so much time going, buy my music, buy my music, without like, tell me a compelling story. Why should I care? Start there, and then you'll see a difference in how people react. I totally agree. I'll take this opportunity to share an anecdote with you. This, this is somewhat related, but the essential point being that you, you need to distinguish yourself. At one time, back when I was with Sub Pop, I left Sub Pop in 2000, but in the late 90s, we were doing a Sub Pop showcase at the Crocodile. And there was this one local band that wanted to get signed, okay? And so what they did is at the showcase, they hired a bunch of homeless dudes to picket the showcase. <laughs> essentially sign such and such and I can't remember the name of the band and no we didn't sign them but I thought no. <laughs> okay for 10 bucks they got my attention <laughs> and I'll give you one other I'll, I'll give you dubious but you know that's kind of the name of the game is what I'm saying it's like how do you get people's attention and that's almost as important as being talented okay just ask Courtney Love <clears throat> <laughs> Oh, I, okay, I got, one, I got one other anecdote i got to share with you. So a few years ago, I'm like, I want to have my own domain name, brucepavitt.com. That would be cool. And so I tried to buy it, and somebody had bought it, right? And it was a guy in Indiana who wanted me to listen to his demo. <laughs> And so he flew out from Indiana, and I met him, and I listened to his demo, and he gave me my domain name. Yeah. So this is what I'm talking about, creativity. Yeah. That's funny. This, this is an anecdote of what not to do if you're trying to get signed. That may be what to do if you're trying to get signed. <laughs> but don't have your mother email me <laughs> and try to set up a meeting. Because that's just embarrassing. <laughs> I took the meeting, though, you know, whatever. I did. And the kid turned out to be 17 years old. So I was like, oh, well, sort of. Although, you know, I do think 17-year-olds have fingers, and I do think they can type. <laughs> pretty sure. But, yeah, that was that. Uh, did that 17-year-old really know that her mom went and did that? 
<laughs> it was a guy, and he flew to America to see me from South Africa. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Don't do that either. <laughs> Just don't do this. Too much pressure on me. I can't take it. <laughs> You're listening to The Future of What? Right now, we're hearing the panel I moderated at San Francisco Music Tech Summit with Bruce Pavitt, Molly Newman, and other awesome industry folks. We'll be right back. San Francisco Music Tech Summit, and we're in a room probably with a whole bunch of people who are interested in technology and, and people who've got great ideas for new apps and stuff. What would we, as people in the music business, want to tell people who are developing new apps and new, new technologies? The first piece of advice I'd give is artists don't want to shill your app for you. A lot of people come to us like, we've got this great app, and they think it's through just trying to get artists on board to use this app. and but they haven't have figured out a plan on how they're actually going to get users so the artists will care and want to use their app. They're like, well, the artists will bring all their fans to use our app. And I'm like, no, they're not. The artists, they are, the artists use Facebook because all the people are there. If you want artists to use your app, get the people there, and the artists will come in droves. And so I think I've, I've had so many apps pitched to, to me of them wanting us to you know, feature it to our audience that uh, we want your artists to drive you know, the adoption in the fan community, and that's just not how it works. I would say don't skimp on your legal budget. Um, (laughs) But seriously, don't skimp on your legal budget. I mean, if you look at the rock stars of the tech world and Google, how many times they've been sued this year, these are the people at the forefront that are fighting to kind of pave the way here on how these tech worlds are going to interact with the record labels and with all the rights owners. But... There's so many people that I see doing shortcuts that get into bad trouble and just get shut down because they can't afford it. So, so just be cautious and aware that you do have to uh, walk a fine line between building a really cool app and getting permission to do what you want to do. I'm involved with a company that's creating an app. <laughs> Hi, Bruce. And I'm an attorney. <laughs> my, <laughs> my, okay, my advice to myself is... Dude, your your app is so f- hot. <laughs> <laughs> Let me explain this because this is being filmed. Eight stem. Uh, essentially, what we're doing is we're introducing a new digital music format that is interactive, and the app is simply the free player that you can get. So what we're trying to do is build a community of artists who are independent, who own their own material and who are interested in having fans remix and customize their music and then share it on social media. The key point to remember is all the money comes to the company. <laughs> okay, no. And then no. goes to the attorney. And then goes to the attorney. <laughs> now we're actually trying to create a new revenue stream for artists that doesn't involve streaming. 
and I just said on the uh, Future of Music panel, and the end of rap was, okay, streaming is kind of the end of the road for musicians. And I'm going to say, well, no, I think that if you create a more engaging experience, that there's a whole new way of thinking about music. And I'm just going to leave you with an anecdote. I have a 17-year-old son who hasn't bought music in three years, okay? He does buy games. And when we showed him the interactivity of this music track that we had, he was totally blown away. And I guarantee you he would pay $1.50 for a song that he could manipulate, engage with, and then share with, with his friends. That's worth $1.50 to a 17-year-old. I've been hearing a lot about this lately. How do you guys feel about this idea that the next wave in, in music sales is actually going to be the app format? So selling music as sort of more like an app. So you basically you get certain things for free, let's say an album. You get most of the tracks for free. If you want more, you have to buy. You know, creating a, a system that actually causes the user to want to spend money. Not having thought a tremendous amount about it, it seems like do you expect people to have 50 to 1,000 different apps based on the artist or the label or whatever it is it's going to be? I mean, there's a certain efficiency that's presented by services. And, um, you know, I think that I think for super fans that there is a, a big opportunity and I think it's something to explore. And I know there's a lot of companies that are that are doing it that are really interesting. But it's, that, that to me seems to be, you know, potential challenge. Just the number? Well, yeah, how do you have, you know, if you're a fan of 100 artists, you have 100 apps for them, and how do you manage that? You know, like, the ecosystem still seems to be an important thing. I think I think it is part of that out of the box thinking for artists too, and and it's something that's monitoring the market right now and what consumers are interested in, and that's important because Apple changed the game, and you know, and now everybody's changing the game again and again and again, and so we have to look at consumer boredom levels really. Like people don't want to buy a whole CD, they don't even want to buy a single. Like Bruce said, interacting, you know, with stems and creating something and feeling like they're contributing to some creative process, that is something that you see more and more with consumer interest. I was on a panel with the founder of Zaya too, and they were doing it was more of a game style uh, with mashups, pre-existing songs, so it didn't require as much creativity from the consumer, but they still got to play and you know work with some of their favorite songs. And there's really a big response to that, so I think it can be an exciting thing. I think it's something to, to explore, but you also want to be cautious that you don't slip into that tormenting your fans with ads and you know you won't get this until you do this and you, you know it's it's a very fine line i think some of those i mean the idea of some of the apps that you kind of curate it's not necessarily that each label or each artist has their own app i, I can't think of one specifically Portia, that you uh, one that's going to sell the way that you were talking about but going back to like interacting in, in the stem side it's there's the desire to create an emotional connection with the music which is sometimes lost within a streaming world where you have access to every single song, maybe not every single song ever mm -hmm. made, but a good portion of songs. How mm -hmm. do you connect with that when you're sitting in your computer, you're working and a song goes by, you're not looking at the artwork, you're not doing some of the things that many of us that have a really deep emotional connection mm -hmm. to music have, have done. How do you connect with fans in a way that is more than, okay, somebody told you to listen to that song, they pushed it to you, you listened to it once, do you remember it 10 minutes from now? Maybe you put it in your catalog, maybe you go back to it, but if you have other, if it's an app that just, the idea that there's other content, maybe you interact a little bit differently. The stems, is, you are then interacting with the song that yeah. creates a potentially more of an emotional connection, I, I um, really, which is why people like mm, vinyl too. I really hear, hear what you're saying. And I think right now with streaming, it's just, just watching my son, music is just ubiquitous. You turn on the tap, music comes on, and it's not really valued. When I was his age, I would be taking the train into Chicago, going to Wax Tracks Records, spending three hours to find that one record. Then I would come home. I would have spent an entire day getting a song. Okay? <laughs> and so then that band would be really important to me, you know? I would have made this pilgrimage. I come back, would put it on my altar. Uh, so there's a much deeper connection. And I think that's one of the reasons why, why vinyl hasn't really died and it's, it's kicking back up again is because the vinyl experience is different. It's deeper. You're looking at the art. There's something in your hand. You're reading the liner notes. And it's, you're taking time out 
from other stuff to be with the music, and I think that's a real value of, of vinyl. I think, and, and part of this is like not, there isn't one answer to any of these things. That everything I just said doesn't mean that streaming is bad. I mean, I love the, the idea that I can go down some rabbit hole that started, yeah, yesterday was a terrible rabbit hole of 80s metal um, that just spiraled out of control and ended in sabotage. Um, <laughs> So there's, I love that idea that you can do those those kinds of things. So it's it's how do you put all of the pieces together? How do you make sure that you're, as an artist and as a label, in you're involved in all of those areas? You know, certainly from our perspective of some of the things that we do, it's making sure that you understand what some of these next platforms are to be able to give our artists and labels the opportunity to to participate in them. And it's it I think it's just really that we can't get stuck on this is the next thing or that's the next thing. It's, it's how does it all fit together and the vinyl resurgence, vinyl never went away as far as I'm concerned, but the fact that it's such a big deal now just shows that there are people that are looking for that emotional connection. So, But it's not the answer to everything, so how do you put it all together? And there's still people that are buying CDs, so it's everything. This is such an interesting thing that we do because basically music is very personal, right? I mean, we've all talked about our own personal connections, how we got interested in music and and music is often a source of community, right? See, when I was 14 years old, not everybody had t- tattoos and wore black. So when I saw somebody who had a tattoo and wore black, I was like, you're my person. Then we could like go be together, you know? And then I was like, do you listen to the Smiths? And they were like, yes. And we're like, yes, we're best friends forever. Um, but so, so we're in this interesting position because music is personal, and yet, when you get into the music business, you have this vested interest in trying to sell music to a bunch of people and not knowing how, you know, we don't know what they like, right? We know what we like. So, and, and for, you know, labels like Sub Pop and Kill Rock Stars and, you know, Lookout, we were basically like, listen, we like this, so we're just going to put it out there because we like it. We weren't really, I don't think, going out and being like, okay, you guys have to like it, and here's the thousand ways that we're going to make you like it. But nowadays, because the marketplace is so vast, and there's millions and millions and millions and millions of tracks, it has to be more focused, right? We have to actually try to get people to hear what we're putting out. So I feel like that's a little bit of a conundrum because I didn't get into this to try to sell people on some record. You know what I mean? I'm like, if you were really cool, you would like it, just like me. (laughs) (laughs) I I think there's a disconnect, too. Just There's a societal disconnect from where we were to, you know, the future of indies. It might be a little sad. Like, you know, when I was a kid, you would sit around with your friends and listen to vinyl records, and there was this experiential connection, and now everybody's on their phones and you're you're not communicating with people you're you know skyping and it more and more there's a disconnect with people so when you talk about this emotional connection with the music and building apps for people to play with it's it's the sad state that that is the emotional connection now is through a phone and i think that's why the performance element will never go away because you still have to go and see live music and experience and that's the experiential thing and i think there's opportunities for artists to really get back to the heart of what music is for people and try and figure out how to bring back that emotional connection I, I think that it's easy. I, I do think I agree that there's a more people like listening. You know, you, you don't you don't listen necessarily the way that we. You don't go to a, spend the entire day going to find a record and then listening to it with your friends. But I still think that there's emotional connection that's happening. I think that there's you know there are communities, and that's where the community part becomes important as an independent as an independent artist is. It's the shows. When you think about how big the festival business is at this point, how do you take that and bring it into for you as an artist how do you incorporate that into into your world and I think that's where some of that emotional connection is I think it's coming back around to some of that being in person and some of the labels that have actually been created around shows or around a particular studio that has some community element to it as well different parties that have become actual record labels so there is a community aspect to it but I I think it's just different than some of what what many of us grew up with and and some of it's actually coming back a bit so good point I love the fact that the uh, Bay Area label Dirty Bird does these barbecues like in Seattle Mm -hmm. 2,500 people Mm rock and some house music at very high volume with with barbecue like okay I, 
I'm really sad I missed that. <laughs> I'm going to go to the next one. Well, you were saying, Portia, the idea of selling, and, and Bruce, you earlier were talking about kind of the label having a flavor, and, and maybe the future of the independent label is more about being a community leader and bringing those people together around barbecues and cool music that they look to you to, to build these playlists and, and these collections of artists, and it's less about marketing and selling. I like the sound of that. <laughs> I, I <don't laughs> Just a little personal background, and around 2000 I moved to a remote island, Orcas Island, and just kind of disengaged from the music business for a while, and it's just kind of become a little too corporate for me. I wasn't relating to it. Uh, the reason I kind of got into punk and indie rock in the first place is because deep sense of community, you go to a small show, you get to meet the artist, maybe you're exchanging letters, and that's kind of what, what fed me. And as, as Sub Pop grew bigger and bigger and bigger, I felt less connected to creative people, which is the kind of the reason I got involved in the first place. So I started going to different music festivals, especially Burning Man was, was a really good one. And I recently went to one, maybe some of you check this out, Symbiosis. I went there this year and it was just such a great party. And here you have a, like Symbiosis, 14,000 people. You've got workshops, you've got music, you've got sculpture, you've got great food it's you're camping you're living with people there's that's it's the ultimate expression of like building community it's worked on an even deeper level than going to like an indie rock show so that's personally what I, what I've been doing because I do crave community that's kind of really what what a lot of this is about and on that note <laughs> I think we're going to bring the community into this I think we're going to open this up to Q&A and we have a mic right here so go right ahead I have to be somewhat amused at this conversation because all of you are professionals in this business. I've been doing something in the music business called radio <laughs> Heard since of it. I was in college. Okay. How many people here have discovered somebody new through the radio? Why is no one from radio part of this conversation? I've had this conversation with Brian. Why is this a forbidden word among you people? Actually, you don't. You don't. don't you don't bring. Wait, let me finish, please. Okay. You don't bring up radio as a community force. There are you thousands did. of radio. I not, did. Not actually, a, not, when I started. I went up, but uh, you know, you'll, 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 and then there's vinyl, and then there's building a community, and and what the thing we did as curators, as DJs, as music directors, and I could give you a long list of acts that I personally helped, even on indie labels, before a big label discovered them to get their careers started. Where is this in the story here? And where is the idea that if vinyl's coming back, what's the other part of it? Now I'll tell you that corporate radio did screw the pooch. Corporate radio did take the DJs out of the equation and centralize the music decision making so no local places could actually break records. That dynamic is changing because the big corporations are losing their value and selling their radio stations to again local groups so uh, the rest of the story is at dj lobster i see you crawling towards the microphone here very hard to get the microphone yeah what's your opinion about radio and how does that work in the future well, local radio, radio one two three four five six. I, I think I would, the better question would, is would, why isn't someone from youtube up here because that's where things are happening yeah. for for independent artists i mean I know. That's because it's for independent artists. There's this. How many independent artists are getting on radio? We're on the radio, yeah. just FYI. Yeah. This, this is a radio yeah. show <laughs> that's played on the radio. Yeah. No, but, we're but, on but. five independent community radio stations around the nation this show. So, we, this show, what we're saying right now, will be on the radio. I, I would love to respond to this. <laughs> okay. Personally, I want to really thank you from the bottom of my heart for your, for your comments, because this is something I've been thinking about for a very long time. Okay, I grew up in the 60s listening to radio, and it was great, okay? It was awesome. Dylan, Stones, James Brown, it was just incredible. So I grew, that's one of the reasons I fell in love with music, because radio was so good. And the whole history of indie music in America, it's all about regional scenes with DJs, breaking bands, 
And the whole mass centralization of the airwaves, I think, is an abomination, and it really pisses me off. Personally, I'm a huge fan of KEXP, based in Seattle. Just an amazing station. They have a great community. It's, it's global now because they stream, and I think they have a huge impact on people's... It's one of the highest rated stations in Seattle, even though it's essentially you know, community radio. So I think your points are really, really well taken. I really respect what you're saying. And I would just quickly add that, you know, to to your point of the commercialization and the centralization, the barriers for independence continue to be very significant. And so we can't look to terrestrial radio necessarily for the access and the, and the assistance in breaking our artists in the same way that perhaps has happened in the past. And so we look to local radio and, and things that are on satellite and, and web radio to, to do so. And, and we have a lot of success and, and platforms like Pandora. So we look at the, and I think YouTube serves that function similarly. So I think that's you know, Bruce did mention chaos in the beginning, and obviously this is, we all come from that, I, I believe, some kind of influence and inspiration from, from the radio community, but we can continue. Another question? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, my question is just for Bruce. Um, I saw in an interview that you had said that you would like to see in an iTunes top ten, like see like five or six songs in that top ten be from independent artists. What do you think it would take for that to happen, and are we getting any closer right now? What's, what's fascinating, the paradox right now, is that there's so much indie music out there. So it's, it's, a, it's a great time for indie artists. You can post stuff on Bandcamp and get it out. But when you look at the pop charts, it's still very controlled. It almost feels like organized crime or something. You know, It's like, <laughs> how the hell do you get your, your music on the indie charts? And... When I see somebody like Macklemore from Seattle totally blowing up and selling millions of records, it's, it's so exciting. Sub Pop has uh, had three different records hitting the charts. And one of the great things about classic you know, era of, of radio, for example, is there were a lot more indies on the charts. And I keep vacillating back and forth between, you know, is, it, is, it, is the wall coming down or not? And Molly, you'd probably have a, a better feel for that than, than myself. On the uh, iTunes charts, yeah, I mean, I Which think... Which is reflective of, like, the radio charts. Absolutely, yeah. yeah, and I mean, I think we were talking earlier, Amy's had a number of top five records this year distributed through Ingrooves, a number one record with Janet Jackson, you know, I mean, that, that there it's are a lot... think of her as an independent, but she's actually an independent. It's true, no, I mean, and it's, it's significant, and, you know, uh, on our in our membership this year, we've had Alabama Shakes, number one, All Time Low, number one, James Taylor, who is on Concord Music Group, you know, we have a number of, we do get there, but, you know, I think it, it, it's a conversation that's consistent with the, the barriers that still remain in that sort of mass commercial success and you know I think what's fascinating and important about our community is that we are looking to new technology like you know 8 stem and and other companies and we want to be you know the conversation that we have in our you know in the HYM world a lot is about making sure that we're not the last to be considered and we're also not to be considered at all and I've learned over the course of my career and many times when different companies that I've been at have tried to do either and it's really challenging. We we are content and artists and labels that must be included in every service, but we can't be considered in a different commercial sense. And, and I'm talking more on like the deal side of things. So, I mean, Taylor Swift is on an independent. Of course, <laughs> she's been a number one for a while. Yeah. <laughs> we got questions uh, over there, back in the back. Elevator music. House yeah. music. <laughs> <laughs> start tap dancing. Hi. What would you say the top ways would be that an independent artist or an independent label would reach out and get their work licensed for movies or commercials? Kevin? The first place to start is finding a, a licensing company that can represent your music. You know, that, that's going to take some doing some homework, looking online, seeing, you know, there's a whole bunch of different kinds of companies. They represent different types of music. You can you can track down music supervisors online. I know they typically don't like that, especially if you're you know just randomly reaching out. I mean, the best thing if you're going to go it alone is to find shows that are using music like yours, find production houses that use music like yours, and and pitch them. 
but typically the best place to start is, you know, if you don't have any placements and are just new to it, is to find a good licensing company that can represent your music and get placements for you. I would also suggest that you join HYM. That's one of the things that we try to help our members do. And we had an event in L.A. last week with about 70 music supervi- no, seventy labels and 45 music supervisors. And uh, we just want it. We are here to help our label members generate r- more revenue and grow their businesses. And so think about that. Do we have time for one more question? Yes, one more question. Um, talk about uh, the, some of the challenges that independent hip-hop has to deal with, where there's kind of this tendency of when independent hip-hop artists, you know, at least lately, get big, they get swallowed up by a lot of the majors. It's almost like the biggest uh, independent hip-hop labels from like the 90s and the aughts are kind of dead, kind of gone. Talk about some of those challenges. Well, I think Run the Jewels is a really good example of how somebody's done it recently in a very successful way. And they did it by cobbling things together. They didn't go just one channel. They didn't just pick one label and have the label do everything. They worked with a whole bunch of different companies and they really visualized how they were going to make that album happen and they were incredibly successful. So, I think there's some really interesting things that are happening in hip-hop in, in general. I mean, some of it does get swallowed up maybe when it's bigger, but we work with a lot of smaller kind of teams of producers and different hip-hop artists that are really interested in I mean, it's been lots of actually really interesting conversations because often they're not that interested in actually getting their music up on iTunes or any kind of the traditional ways. They are interested in getting it up on SoundCloud. They want to put mixtapes. They um, want to be on streaming services potentially. But they're trying to build a fan base, but they're kind of less interested about how, how you can actually make money at it. And and that's what we found, a lot of people talking about that and having actual conversations where you can go we can help you do this and you should put your music everywhere you know don't don't limit yourself from just putting out the the mixtape or just being on a streaming site for us it's one of the most I mean, we've had, we've worked with some really interesting hip hop artists on the smaller side um, that are growing into bigger artists so I'm not sure exactly what the what the challenge you feel like is is it that that you're not sure if I just feel like there's fewer relevant independent hip-hop labels, like, you know, Ruckus was a really big one in the 90s. I mean, OK Player seems to be doing all right, but, you know, even they don't have the... I mean, TDE stands out as, like, the only truly independent one that's really kind of been able to transcend. You know, like, a sub-pop was independent, and they've become kind of an ubiquitous name, you know? And in hip-hop, those names are kind of lacking, you know? Whereas in the, in the late 90s, they were, they were staples. So. I mean, it, it, it occurs to me that some there are some records that maybe it's, they're still artist-run labels. Like, the game was number one last week, I think, with two records or mm-hmm. two weeks in a row. You know, with, on e, with distributed by E1. So, you know, it it may just be the, an issue of perception or that they're not getting credit for being independent because they're sort of big stars or they used to be on you know big labels or whatever. But um, I think there is a certain amount of success that maybe isn't getting the credit it, it should. Okay, well, thank you guys for coming, and thanks for all the panelists, and thanks for being on The Future of What. And that's our show. Thanks to the producers, staff, and engineers of San Francisco Music Tech Summit. You guys did an awesome job. The music we played today was used by permission. You heard Bratmobile and our theme song, Mind Your Own Business by The Delta Five. If you enjoy this show, please consider subscribing to our podcast on Bandcamp. We can't do this without you. Also, follow us on Twitter, at KRSFOW. Our program was engineered by Brent Asbury at Beta Petrol and is produced by John Sepulveda, Will Watts, and Anna McLean. I'm Portia Sabin, president of Kill Rockstars. See you next week.